I'm Cape Jewel, and this is Comic Smack, your weekly, daily, all the time, anytime comic book show where I give you your fix of everything you need to know from the world of comic books and superheroes. And on today's show, we're taking a closer look at the astonishing Ant Man issue number 13. The saga of Scott Lang is coming to a close. Can he clear his name? Let's hop on in together and find out, shall we? All right, then. So, as we dig on into the comic, the trial of Ant Man continues. She Hulk decides to bring up some of Scott's employees as character witnesses. As well meaning as they might be, reformed supervillains like Machine Smith and Grizzly don't exactly paint the most flattering picture of poor Scott. Unfortunately, Dara Deerling doesn't serve much better on the stand either. You get the distinct feeling Janice the Beatle wants to take the boots to her romantic rival, even though she claims to not care about Scott all that much. Now, you might be asking yourself right now, aren't there like a dozen superheroes that Scott could call upon to be character witnesses? Wouldn't they do a great job steering the trial in his favor? Uh, yeah, well, about that. Scott basically says the other heroes are wrapped up in their own business right now, either fighting Hydra or fighting each other. I don't think this is a direct reference to Civil War II, but it might as well be. It's during the recess from the trial, Scott manages to ask the daughter of Tombstone why she was so interested in this trial, beyond, you know, just kind of getting to be a jerk to him legally. Turns out what the Beatle is really after is Pym Particle. She says she hates being the only insect-themed character in the Marvel Universe who doesn't have access to shrinking technology. Beatle says as part of her legal strategy, they're going to be bringing the Ant-Man suit in later that day, and if Scott wants to make it through this trial, he'll pass off the Pym Particles to her, and in doing so, the trial will end on his terms. Ant-Man really, really hates this idea. It's not like he needed any more reason to feel like a scumbag, but unfortunately, he has no other play in this scenario, so it looks like he's going to have to go ahead with it. What Scott, and indeed no one in the courtroom could possibly know, however, is that the Ant-Man helmet that just so happens to house the secret laboratory of Hank Pym, the former Ant-Man, had just so happened to be taken over by the evil Darren Cross, a had the mad scientist and even Crossfire. Cross has commandeered Hank Pym's experimental yellow jacket armor, and oh look, it looks exactly like the yellow jacket armor from the movies. Go figure, huh? Ant-Man is greatly outnumbered and outgunned, but thankfully, this court situation just so happened to bring some of his closest friends and allies nearby, so what we essentially get here is a reunion of Matt Fraction's Fantastic Four, minus Medusa, of course. The good guys put up a valiant fight, but the yellow jacket armor proves to be incredibly powerful as it's actually able to sap energy from Pym particles around it. Scott's daughter, Stinger, joins the fight too for what little good it does her. It is, however, Casey who figures out that maybe they're going about this fight with yellow jacket all wrong. You'll recall back in the last issue, they gave Scott special pills to retard his shrinking ability during the trial. Casey gets the amazing idea that maybe they should try and shove some of those down Darren Cross's pink throat. This plan ends up working in the bad guy guys are vanquished, which means the trial can continue. Now, what so happened to be Beatles' final last Hail Mary play? The final character witness we see brought up in this trial is none other than Scott's ex-wife, Cassie's mother. Now, you would think with everything we've seen with this lady throughout the book, she's going to be the nail in old Ant-Man's coffin, gonna really bury him deep. No, actually, she doesn't. Instead, she more or less reiterates the theme of the book up until this point, and that is that while Scott may not be great at everything, he is a good father at the end of the day. He might not be a famous hero, but to one girl out there, he is the best hero, and aw, isn't that just the sweetest? So, as the comic winds down, Scott ends up getting off scot-free, clearing his name, and his daughter is even allowed to continue to be a superhero with her mother's blessing. Scott ends the comic by saying everything good he's ever done in this world he did for his daughter. She's truly his hero, as the comic ends. And so concludes Astonishing Ant-Man number 13, and indeed Nick Spencer's time with Scott Lang Ant-Man. It's a run that lasted about three years, all things considered, and I don't think I would be overstepping my boundaries by saying it was probably one of the best Ant-Man stories ever written. Nick Spencer has a real flair for lovable schlubs. He did it in Superior Foes of Spider-Man, and he does it here for Scott Lang. Not only is Scott funny, a little pathetic, you know, he's got depth to him. He's got layers, and really this final issue, which was extra length I should have, kind of brings everything full circle and puts a nice little cherry on events. Honestly, I don't know what other nice things I could say about it. I loved this book from start to finish, it was a great run, and it will most definitely be on my best of the year list for 2016. Overall, I would give this one a 10 out of 10. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching my newest video. I hope you enjoyed it, and while you're here, why not check out another video I have on offer? Or maybe if you're feeling in a supportive mood, you want to like or subscribe. And if you want to support the creation of more videos just like this one, then please, by all means, check out the Cape Joel Patreon. A little bit goes a very long way, and I will see you all next time.